Hey, what is up guys? It's your boy Spee here, and today we're gonna be doing a draft analysis and then a game analysis of EG versus Thunder Week. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are big, big fans of EG. Personally, I personally love watching them play. I think the way they draft and the way they play is, I'm not gonna say it's like completely unique. I would say the way they draft is like somewhat unique. They're very flexible. They have a couple of flex picks that they just love being obnoxious with. If you don't know what these picks are, they're very flexible. From my experience with Primal Beast, Snapfire, uh, and Death Prophet, you'll see these heroes frequently throughout their DPC matches. Like basically, if you look here and I pull up their DPC match, you'll see in their second match here, they went for, they actually had all three of them. <laughs> they had all three of them. The Snap was uh, mid this game, the Primal was four, and the DP was offlane, right? So very, very flexible in that regard. However, the DP was awfully in that game. This game, the DP ends up going mid lane. So as you can see, it's very hard to draft into them. They understand the value of this Death Prophet hero. I definitely agree that this hero is like quite stupid. Definitely too strong. Uh, probably needs to get nerfed a little bit. And uh, yeah, maybe a little bit too good. Maybe a little, a little bit too good. Also, I want to tell you guys that if you've been struggling with solo queue and you're looking to get to the next rank, I'm going to be able to help you. Like literally with the Game Leap website, I'm going to give you guys guides that are going to make it unbelievably clear on what you need to do. So if you've been stuck in the solo queue grind, you don't know what to do and you want to become absolutely broken. <laughs> but like actually you want to become much much better at dota and you want to take it more seriously the game leap website is going to help you do that so click the link down below i'm going to help you get to the next rank and i'll see you there getting into the draft i'm going to go over it quickly just kind of talk quickly about why i think the eg draft is good and then move on all right first pick they had first pick this game they could have picked brood no brood brood completely ignored kind of insane death prophet first pick a hero that's actually not good against brood uh from my experience they go Bat Abaddon, so opting to not pick up the Brood. Bat Abaddon's kind of weird. I don't really understand Bat Abaddon. I don't think Abaddon makes a lot of sense in the Death Prophet. She lanes very well into Abaddon, carry or position five. So you're kind of putting yourself in a weird spot there. Uh, they pick up Bat Rider, which maybe they're denying picking the Bat Rider. They don't want EG to pick the Abaddon. I mean, right? They don't want EG to pick Abaddon here. So they're taking it away from them, but definitely a little bit weird. They go for the Shadow Demon, which makes quite a bit of sense, right? You have a hero that is just good against Batrider. You buy the shard and you dispel whoever Batrider goes on and it's very easy. You also can disrupt whoever Batrider lassos, so it's very easy to execute from there. From that point on, Thunder Awaken picks up the clockwork, very solid clockwork game, kind of just picking up a stun. Then EG kind of doubling down on just nukes and ranged heroes. You know, they're definitely gonna need some sort of stun at this point in the draft. You know what I mean? Like none of these heroes really initiate. So kind of a risky set of picks here, but we'll see how they round it out. But yeah, Rubik, I mean, honestly, honestly, I'm not gonna lie. I don't really fully understand the Rubik here. The only reason why I say that is the steals are not that good. Abaddon shield is very good. I'll give them that. Like stealing Abaddon shield is incredibly useful in almost every game. In this case, it purges everything from Batrider, right? So I will say that outside of that, it's not that great. It lanes okay into Clockwork. It lanes okay into Abaddon. So it's like fine, you know what I mean? It's fine. But from there, yeah, they pick up the Rubik Centaur. So immediately showing that, okay, Death Prophet is mid. I was a little bit surprised that they picked Centaur here. I suppose they just didn't want to show their safe laner for whatever reason. I don't know exactly why. Maybe they just don't feel like they have a strong enough safe laner to pick here that won't get counterpicked. And that's pretty reasonable. So they kind of just pick up one of the most resilient offlaners or offlane combos in the game, the Centaur Rubik. I will say Centaur Rubik, I feel like struggles a little bit against Clockwork. Not too much in the early levels, but as the lane progresses and Clockwork hits level three, it can be a little bit hard. However, they needed a stun hero, let's be real. They don't have a stun. They have two setup stuns for Centaurs. They can lane SD Centaur or Rubik Centaur. Both are very, very strong lanes, very hard to deal with. And then the Stampede, Stampede's pretty good, right? I would say Stampede's pretty good this game. Limited stuns here, right? Uh, obviously you might be like, what? They have, you know, Cogs. And Cogs is good against Stampede because obviously you can't Stampede out of Cogs. But outside of the Cogs, I feel like the lack of stuns here is very kiteable, right? Unless Batrider's lassoing someone, which is like barely any time in the fight, then Stampede is extremely useful at kiting him out. So I, I think that's mostly what it comes down to. They go for the Drow on Thunder Awaken. Makes sense to me. It counters out the DP. Yes, you have Stampede, which is like annoying for Drow. But even at this point of the game, like they have a lot of heroes to protect Drow. You have an Abaddon in the front. You have a Clockwork protecting the Drow. The Drow is good against Death Prophet. But yeah, I just feel that... I don't know, I feel like it's a little bit risky. It's definitely a hero that can potentially feed to Shadow Demon uh, Centaur or Rubik Centaur, maybe. 
but at the same time with a clockwork in front of you, probably not going to happen, right? However, that means you're running a position 4 Abaddon, or an offlane Abaddon. I don't know, right? Hard to say. I will say this looks like a horrible Abaddon game. I mean, I guess you can purge Centaur Stun, but like, that's kind of hard, right? It's like pretty hard to purge things like Centaur Stun. And, and the only reason why is it's just like, it's not that long of a duration stun. So by the time you purge them, most of the time the damage has been dealt. So I don't know, this Abaddon pick on 6-7 seems really bad to me. And they go for the Weaver last pick, which is honestly kind of wild. The reason why I say it's wild is even though it's like sort of good, as I mentioned, a general lack of stuns. There's not a lack of silence here. Now with the drow, that doesn't really matter in the early game to the mid game when you're farming. So like Weaver should be able to free farm. I will say that. It's also a safe laner here that generally can't be counterpicked, right? For instance, the Batrider, Batrider does not want to lean into safe lane Weaver. That matchup is not good from my experience. The Weaver should win that lane because you can't really get dove. And then it's just hard to pick into this lane, right? It's a very resilient laner. Very, very resilient laner. I also just made a video on offlane weavers, so check that out, guys. And they go for the Brood last pick, <laughs> which is something to see for sure. Brood last pick is pretty damn funny, man. Brood last pick, uh, that's that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. But yeah, the Weaver is going to be able to farm. Um, very high tempo team comp, EG looking to run them over. But the Drow is scary this game, man. Drow with a lot of farm carries this game, so let's get into it. Alright, so I'm going to be focused on the gameplay of Whisper here. We're going to be specifically watching his gameplay and see how he deals with this very difficult Drow Abaddon lane, right? Abaddon is definitely a hero that pressures Centaur decently well. Uh, Centaur has very bad armor at 0 at level 1. He has 7.9 base regen though, so that's why you buy Ring of Protection. You have a ton of base regen, but you're not very tanky. So you can see he's mainly playing just to kind of juke out the Centaur and allow his Rubik to, to essentially drag the wave. And so eventually get the, the range creep secured just by auto-attacking it. Super simple, very nice, as he's looking to stun the Drow. <laughs> that's pretty funny. He thought the Drow would uh, come over and connect. But the Rubik connecting the wave. Oh, I didn't know that's how that... I didn't know that's how that works. That's pretty cool. Huh. The Abaddon brought the wave here, and I didn't know it would connect it like that. That's pretty interesting. But the Centaur should be able to drag. So this is how they're going to deal with this hard lane, right? You don't really want to play into the Drow in the early levels. This matchup is just not very good. Uh, the reason why is, like, as I said, Centaur has bad armor, and Drow just clicks you a ton. Like, this is even good, very good pressure from the side of Thunder. Just a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, auto attacks onto that onto that centaur. So this is honestly why Whispers the Goat. This guy's just a really smart guy, and he's able to adapt to the moment extremely well. Like for instance, right here, the wave is pushing in, right? Drow is about to be able to static the wave under her tower. I'm just gonna show you that quickly, right? So Drow can static the wave under the tower here, and that's where the lane can get pretty hard for the centaur, right? Where you just get click, click, click. Now he could actually take two points retaliate at this point and kind of just deal with the draw that way. Like it makes it pretty hard for draw to pressure you. However, at the same time, Abaddon should take heal. Okay, no, he didn't. But if he takes heal, then he can just spam heal the draw and then she can just keep clicking, all right? So it's definitely a lane where you want to pull it back and generally chill is he's going to pick up the ring of health. But what he does here is awesome. He sees that the Abaddon is full HP, but this Rubik uh, Centaur lane is very BS. It's extremely hard to deal with. And MJZ with full HP and shield dies. He baits him in with the side pull, right? Identifies that he walks up. They're going to lift into Stomp. That's going to clap the wave because of the fact that Rubik, Abaddon, and Centaur are all in range of the Hellbear Smasher. It claps, doing damage to the Abaddon, and they pick up first blood. So at this point in the lane with Vanguard, you can start to drag the wave. He's going to take two points in the Retaliate, which I like with Vanguard. It just allows you to farm essentially infinitely, right? You can just tank the creeps, and it allows you to nuke out the wave. He will use double educationally to clear the camp a little bit faster, as we'll even see him do it again here. And I'm surprised he's chasing this kill. He actually uses the stampede to get the kill. I'm surprised he makes the play to kind of walk over to the camp here. And the only reason why I'm surprised by that is I would have expected for him to drag the next creep wave, right? What I mean by that is in between the tier one and tier two, take the creep wave and move away from the drow. So I'm a little bit surprised he chased. Seems like a general waste of time to me. But either way, he's going to be able to take the next wave and continue to farm. And the reason why he's doing this is because it's just actually efficient, right? Yes, maybe he could be a little annoying to Drow, but if he tries that, it's very likely that Batrider can TP in. Where he currently is on this camp, he's actually a lot safer as he Tumbler toys over the hill and now can probably stack this camp, right? All right, from there, he ends up farming in 11 minute blink, which is pretty crazy considering he was against the lane that I would say is pretty good against Centaur. I, I have seen Centaurs like truly feed the Drow Ranger, so doing a great job getting out of this laning stage. From there, he's going to max out the Q, actually not maxing out his Retaliate, not finishing it off, and TPs to a major top fight. 
He's probably going to pop the Stampede, I would imagine. Maybe try to save his DP. Oh, that has a, she barely lives. I don't know if this is much of a fight, though. So in this fight upcoming here, he definitely has to be careful about the fact that his team has pretty limited follow-up damage when Death Prophet's dead. Weaver is definitely reasonably strong here, right? So they have that going for them. Um, the Weaver is definitely strong, but as we'll see him stomp in, kind of next to the Weaver, pop the Abaddon ulti and kite out. I really like that he's kiting out here. You don't want to like man up, even though you do have Vanguard and Retaliate, you're actually not that tanky at this point of the game. Like, you're really not. You know, this Brood is quite threatening to him for sure. And Batrider is like, you know, basically a guaranteed kill. He ends up going back in on the Abaddon and auto attacks him just because, you know, he thought he was in range to finish him off. From there, he's going to get the kill and then looks for a double edge. I actually even think that going for this double edge is risky, right? Because if the clock cogs him here and Batrider is able to follow up, Perhaps he just dies. Like, I don't know why Batrider's not able to connect here, but either way, uh, he kites out now, right? Very important. Kiting out, waiting his blink. It's going to allow him to get off the double edge, and he's able to finish off the clockwork, picking up another major kill. From there, he ends up looking around, thinking that, okay, maybe my Death Prophet can connect. Then he's going to go back to farming up the top wave. And he's going to pick up a pretty cool item here. He's going for Guardian Greaves. Now, why Guardian Greaves? It dispels a lot this game. It dispels Batrider's Sticky Napalm, Batrider's Flame Break, Actually, very importantly and underrated, it purges uh, Brood's Silken Bola, and Brood's Spiders do practically no damage if you're not affected by her third ability, Silken Bola. And finally, and most importantly, is Drow. Gets rid of Gust, gets rid of Frost Arrow stacks, and on top of that just gives a lot of armor. The nice thing about Greaves on Centaur is your hero desperately needs armor, right? A especially against like Drow, right? I mean, this Drow, she's gonna chop through you if you don't have added armor. I mean, it's not even about your base armor. You just, like, any hero, even if they have a ton of base armor, they need added armor. So, in general, Greaves is kind of just a counter to Drow, because if someone drops low and she's trying to finish them off, you give a ton of armor, and that counters out Drow's ultimate. It only pierces through your base armor, but not your added armor. From there, Whisper is gonna take a bit of responsibility in clearing out the top side of the map and sort of dealing with the Brood. I will admit they certainly have a brute problem and it's really not his job to deal with it. Like, yes, you can blink stomp double edge the spiders, but if you mess up, you just die. Like even here, right? The clock kills him. This is not a free centaur game whatsoever. Like some games, your hero can kind of just stampede away. You're not doing that against Batrider. You're not doing that against Clock uh, in a lot of scenarios. So he's going to push in the wave. I actually think that the side of Thunder should be threatening him a lot more. They should be putting more pressure with the spiders, uh, but they're not. This is what it is. In this upcoming fight here, we see such a clutch fight from EG. Honestly, Thunder Awaken nearly outplaying them and like getting the job done. Because I think Thunder Awaken's draft, like now I'm looking at it in the mid game, it's really hard for EG to play into, right? This Weaver, he is picking up, you can see a BKB, but until he has this BKB completed, he's truly not that survivable, right? Like he dies to a lot of different combinations of heroes. And so it, it, it's a hard game for the Weaver, right? Very hard game for the Weaver. So he ends up getting picked off. They transition that into a Roche, which they get. Right, they get, and EG takes the fight anyway. What I really like about his gameplay here is he's, he bull whips the, the DP, helps her get out. It's actually a bigger deal than people think. From there, he kind of sees that the Exo is going to town on the Broodmother, and he's going to pop the Stomp. Nice mech from the Brood to keep herself alive and preventing her from getting bursted. Very, very good. From here, he only, I mean, he does walk in here, which, I mean, he's going to pop the mech. Very nice. He walks in. I think it's because he kind of sees that they're kiting out, right? The enemy team is disengaging and he wants to maybe look for a double edge on the Drow, and he ends up actually being correct. The Blink was on cooldown for a long time anyway, and the enemy was gonna have to disengage. I mean, this is just really good awareness to know, like, we're on the upside of, the, of this fight, right? We're winning this fight, so let me actually run in now. However, if the fight is even, and you're, like, initially jumping in, and I'm, I'm gonna show you what I mean, right? You'll see it in, in the beginning of this clip, right? So, as he jumps in here, they're on a smoke, jumps in, nukes, and then he's gonna walk away. And it's very important to walk away here. If you don't walk away, honestly, he even walked away a little bit slow. If you don't walk away, you die. You get cogs, you die. 100%. He's dead. No stampede, no way out of cogs. Right? Dead. He's 100% dead. The DP is much faster and has to be keeping. So, because of the fact that he doesn't die there, it gets a reinitiation. Obviously, very key. From there, now, because of the fact that Weaver is back and they've overcommitted very, very hard. Basically, the big thing is EG knows that everything is on cooldown for the side of Thunder. Brood is out of spiders. Clock spells are on cooldown at the moment. He actually has hookshot, but... No lasso, no Abaddon ulti now. Like, everything's kind of just been expended. Uh, even the Drow, I believe, her, they probably knew her pike was on cooldown. Oh, no, it wasn't. Oh, it was, okay, yeah, yeah, it, will, it was when they were chasing her. And that's, that's a big deal, because that's the item you need to stay on top of her. If she has the pike off cooldown, you're not going to be able to stick on top of her. It's just not going to work like that. So he ends up walking forward, 
missing a stomp because you know that's how you do it he is going to blink in and look for a double edge here they're clearly looking to finish off the drought gets gusted probably should have double edge a little bit faster here but eventually is able to close the gap and barely get up a stomp and finish off the drow and eventually onto the brood just beautifully done from the side of thunder at this point in the game he's going to pick up a four staff and i love this purchase right the fact that most people don't consider four staff a viable item on core heroes is just insane against something of the likes of like drow and clock two heroes that counter centaur four staff's incredible if you get gusted he can now greaves and four staff and of course he, if he gets cogs well the best item in the game is definitely four staff even bkb is not that good against clock like yes bkb is good but it's 4k gold and you still can die to hookshot cogs and just drow autos so i love the idea of the four staff the cheap timing and it kind of has a similar uh, job of, of bkb this game he can get saved from magic damage by his shadow demon anyway so it doesn't even necessarily need bkb this game because of the fact that shadow demon will buy shard which he already has i think one thing that's really impressive to me about eg and i'm actually gonna end the video on this clip is they're really good about kind of just understanding where the enemy is and in dota when you guys are trying to win your pubs it's very important that you're watching the map and you're trying to get a read on when the enemy is making aggressive movements right it, it's like you're not going to see a lot of smoke ganks in your average pub, but you're going to see a lot of movements up hills, right? The enemy is just going to invade your jungle kind of randomly at times. And if you can be the guy who reads that movement, it makes it very clear to your team that, hey, the enemy team is running into our jungle. They're running at, you know, our weaver, they're running at our carry, our offlane, our support, whatever it is. And you can be the person who sets up the counter initiation. Usually counter initiation and baiting is very powerful in pubs. Like it's, it's just very effective as a strategy. Um, because people are not used to it right they're not used to it and because of the fact that they're holding their hill and they're ready for the smoke the reason why they're ready for the smoke is thunder is just not pushing in bot right they're not clearing bot at all so either they're afraid or they're smoked right what i mean by that is like if they were not smoked they would probably push in bot wave now i'm not going to say that's a guarantee but they probably would push in bot wave and yeah they ended up being smoked and they find the jump on the batrider beautiful lift from matthew on the rubik they find him out Drow does end up TPing away, unfortunately. Yeah, EG ends up kind of taking the game from here. He picks up a Halberd, actually has the Abyssal Blade queued up, which I kind of like. It's a cute as he four staffs to Drow in. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty nice. I really like the Halberd, right? His build just makes a lot of sense to me. Every item addresses the enemy team very well. He doesn't put a heavy emphasis on BKB because it's just not that good of a BKB game. Like, yes, it's kind of nice against Drow, but Greaves is just better. It helps your whole team. And four staff is very versatile and cheaper than BKB and also you know, saves you from drought. So it just, I love his itemization. He understands the lack of control, doesn't necessarily need BKB, can itemize for the drow, kind of help his armor problem with the Greaves, just Greaves being a very great item with DP as well, a hero that generally lacks armor, kind of needs it against his physical damage, helps her out a little bit. I, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say Greaves is like an insane armor item because of the fact that it really only kicks in significantly when you drop below 25% HP, but uh, it does matter. And yeah, that's going to be the end of the match and end of the video. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this deep analysis of uh, EG versus Thunder Awaken. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace. And that's all. But remember, before you leave, come on, before you tune out, subscribe to the Game Leap website where we are going to help you get to the next rank. If you're stuck, click the link down below and I'm out. Peace.